Okay, uh, we're ready for our next talk. Um, this is Jeffrey Grossenbach, and he's going to talk about something fairly interesting. He's actually going to talk about you. He's been studying us, trying to figure out how we do what we do, and uh, now he's going to let you know what he figured out about us figuring out things. There you go. Tutorials uh, covered Node.js. Well, we covered uh, jQuery a long time ago. Node.js about two years ago. Express about six months ago, and we're, we're updating that for Express 3.0. Is that all? And that works better. Okay. But what I want to talk about today uh, begins with skateboarding. In the summer of 1982, a 16-year-old boy spent his summer in the driveway figuring out how to jump into the air on a skateboard. Uh, now, this is called an ollie. If any of you have watched skateboarders or done it yourself, then you know that it's actually not that difficult. If any of you were to... Arr, uh, if any of you were to walk out of here right now, buy a skateboard, and try to learn how to jump into the air, how to do an ollie, uh, you could learn it in maybe a week or two. But what it took was one person to just spend the time figuring out how it could be done and find out that it was possible. And then when other people saw that, they could figure out how to do it too. That boy's name was Rodney Mullen. And in my opinion, he's one of the greatest skateboarders ever. He invented dozens of other tricks uh, from very simple to advanced. One of them is called the impossible, which kind of tells you how difficult it is. But it made me think, well, are there similar things we could learn in programming just by watching other people write code? You know, we can go to, with open source, we can see the final product of, of code. We can read through finished source code. But it's, there's a lot to be learned by actually watching someone write code and watch that process as they think through problems or, or figure things out, even get stuck. So. Uh, at Peep Code, we called this the play-by-play -play series and went around and interviewed uh, a bunch of different developers. And, and we're going to continue doing this because it's been pretty popular and people really enjoy seeing this uh, from a whole variety of languages. Ruby, Python, JavaScript, both designers and developers. Uh, we started with developers, but then we talked to some pretty brilliant designers as well. And I think that's a big part of creativity is like mixing ideas from different fields and often as, as developers, we don't, maybe we just think that we have nothing to learn from designers, or because this is a JavaScript conference, you know, a lot of designers probably here as well, learn what can you learn from developers? So we took that from, uh, from both angles. So here's, here's some of the things that, that I learned. First, tools. What text editors do people use? How do they use them? Uh, what other things do they use in addition to text editors? Uh, first clip here is from Tim, Tim Caswell, uh, website How to Node. He's one of the first authors of the Connect uh, module. Currently works for Cloud9 in browser IDE. And he likes a very clean environment. In fact, he reinstalls his entire operating system a couple times a month. Here's what he says on his tools. Just kind of a stock install, or do you have your yeah, stock install. window manager or something? No, no. I, I, since I reinstall so often, I pretty much can't customize my environment. Okay. I use I use regular Bash. I turn on the color prompt, and that's about it. Do you have any customs? I mean, assume you have to copy SSH keys or things like that. But do you have a lot of like personal shortcuts and aliases and stuff? Maybe we'll see those as you start. No, I mean I have one repo that's like some Vim settings that sometimes I'll pull from GitHub and link, and it's like some pretty colors. But otherwise, but otherwise, no. I don't. In fact, I, half the time I don't remember to save my SSH keys, and so I have to just generate <laughs> them new and push them all to all the machines. But it, it keeps them fresh, right? There's no still keys anywhere. <laughs> so he forgets to even save his own credentials, uh, but that has made him very agile in rebuilding his entire system. Now it's in, in, has was important for me to to see other people work and see that you know the, the text editor, it's definitely where we spend a lot of time. We're writing code that's text. But that's not the only tool. 
I like to sketch, and so it was maybe not a surprise that uh, a designer that I talked with also liked to sketch. This is Ryan Singer of 37 Signals talking about the limits of sketching before you go into code. The one thing that we haven't figured out yet is um, how to get that email address. Because do we want you to scroll through the 195 that you didn't pick? But I think we could probably figure that out. I'm not worried about it. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time sketching it right now. Like, I'm only sketching about stuff I'm worried about. Yeah. Right? Like, sketching, it's not like this is the process. First, you sketch everything. And then you do, the, and that, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like that at all. It's more like um, uh, when you're worried about something, sketching can help you. Right? It's, it's another tool for right. figuring out the problem. It's yeah. just a medicine to the pain of, of worry. You know, like I'm not confident enough to spend time in code because I think I can go down the wrong direction and I'm going to screw around wasting time. So I'm going to remove that worry by, by proving myself that I, my thinking is clear about what I'm going to do. But it doesn't mean that I have to sketch the whole app. You know, I just need to sketch enough that I know what I'm doing. So I appreciated that, that development and design has different stages to it and we need different tools to work with those different stages. And for him, sketching was a big part of that, being able to focus on solving one part of the, the problem of development in his mind, and then move into code once he had thought through those. Now, is, I, I like to do design and development, so I do definitely like to pick up a pen and, and sketch things out, whether it's visual or just code flow related kinds of things. But it was interesting to me to talk to Nevin Morgan of Panic Software, who's also a designer, but he doesn't like to sketch. In fact, he likes to think of words to describe things and use that as part of his problem solving process. One reason I don't do so much sketching is that my equivalent of sketching on paper is uh, making references to other things, basically. So if I say something like highway signage, in those two words, I've described to you exactly, like, you, I'm sure we have the same image. You have the big green signs, or brown, for, like, the, you know, parks and whatnot, that, you know, are sort of big round wrecks. They're made of that slightly shiny, uh, you know, metal, so they're like light at night. They have that inset white border around the thing, a very legible, you know, font, interstate, or whatever it's called now. Um, like, you get all of that for free if you just make a reference to the right thing. So that's kind of how I sketch, both in my head and when talking to other people. And I just sort of rely on the fact that most people are familiar with, you know, the same basic set of pop culture. Now, obviously, this technique works a lot better for design, because as he said, he was thinking of something visual, was able to just give a few words to other people on his team, and that was kind of a, a type of compression to where he could just give them a few words that communicated a whole bunch of ideas that they could go if they needed to work on other parts of this design. One thing I was amazed of watching this though is th within the first two minutes that I gave him this problem, which was you know a difficult part of this whole thing is thinking of a problem that's concise enough that people can solve it in 90 minutes, but difficult enough that, that it's gonna cause them to think a little bit. But within the first two minutes, he had this, the problem was trail directions. It was like, you're gonna make a mobile app to help people make and read directions if they're hiking, riding a bicycle, riding a horse or whatever through the woods. And right away he realized this, it was kind of a combination of a recipe if you were cooking and highway signage, as he said. And you know, it's just amazing to watch someone who's spent a lot of time pulling apart and analyzing different kinds of things that he could do it that quickly just within a couple minutes and really made me want to work on my own skills of analysis and kind of summer, summarization. It doesn't come, you know, it, it takes, takes a lot of work and special skill, but it was some, something to definitely aim for. Now, it's also important to understand the weaknesses of all your tools. Uh, obviously, we can't build an entire application just by sketching or by talking about it. We have to get into code. And so understanding those different multiple stages of thought and the best tools to work with each is also very important. But uh, once we are in the text editor, it's good to know, know a text editor and know how to use it well. Uh, one person I think who may 
understand his text editor a little too much is Gary Bernhardt. Mm -hmm. He's been mentioned here already with his what talk, which was uh, kind of funny, what, yep. And uh, I'd like to think we have a, had had a tiny uh, amount of influence in his current fame because we were the first ones to record uh, this kind of video series with him about two years ago. Uh, here he's talking about how fast you can type different words. You used visual mode there to, to highlight a couple lines and then delete them, right? I did. I didn't Isn't that say... the whole point of Vim? <laughs> you know, 2DD? Well, so, so what you're suggesting is 2DD. What I actually did was visual line mode JDE. It's the same number okay, of commands. Now, now, I do have a justification here. If you look, uh, unfortunately, I'm using QWERTY layout. I used to use Dvorak, but I switched back. And I think you're a Dvorak user, right? So this won't apply as much to you because J is all kinds of inconvenient on Dvorak. But anyway, if you look at 2DD on a QWERTY keyboard, you're reaching way up to 2, which is 2 rows above home. That's bad. So that's the 2. And then DD is the same key twice, which is actually slow. When you are really a quick typer, hitting the same key twice is slow. If you look at Shift V, J, D, Shift V is easy for me. I do a lot of shifting. And V is a little inconvenient, but then J, D is both home row. So overall, I think this is a faster keystroke. <laughs> That's a Vim user. Yeah, can I have an R? Um, thank you. So this guy has spent an excruciating amount of time optimizing how fast he types and how, which characters. Source code control. Definitely, uh, definitely we're using some kind of source con code control. One of the people I really look up to, kind of controversial figure uh, on a variety of open source, is a guy named Zed Shaw. Anybody know Zed Shaw? And uh, he, you know, he's kind of a has kind of a caustic personality online, but if you meet him in person, really nice guy and really uh, insightful things to say. Here he says that source code control is not just backup of your code, it's communication, and you should uh, give a lot of thought to it. Like, I very rarely commit stuff to the wrong branches. I, I'm just very careful. I'm like, okay, so this should go in there. I think that comes because everyone else thinks of um, source control tools as code backup. And I think of it as code talk, like communication. I'm communicating with someone else, so I gotta make sure that it's a good message, right? Like if I spent time writing an email, I spend time writing this. So I make sure that it has a good commit message, same like I would do a subject. Hey, person who's reading this, this is why you should read this. And then I make sure that it's going to the right place, like the right address, what branch is it? And I've got, you know, the same things you do with email, I do with like code tools, you know. Um, and then, so that's pretty universal. I mean, if I use HG, I use Git, I do the same thing. I thought that was really insightful, and that's one of the things I enjoy whenever I have, uh, on the rare occasions I have to talk, opportunity to talk with Zed is he just really thinks of things in just a completely different way. And, uh, but once he said that, I thought, that's obvious. What we're doing is, is using source code control to communicate. So workflow, not only tools, but also workflow, uh, definitely an area that we can learn from watching other people code. Part of that is understanding the context of where we work. One of the things I enjoy about working with JavaScript, now that we have powerful JavaScript on the server, is that there's less of an excuse to kind of ignore the other half of the, you know, if you work on the server, you kind of don't have as much of an excuse to ignore the client. And if you work on the client, well, hey, maybe you can learn a little bit about of how Express works on the server or, or something like that. And so there's more opportunity to learn about the context of code. And that happens in many ways. Here's Ryan Singer again talking about context with time before, now, and after. It's not helpful to look at, at to think of UI as being only the screen level. Because every screen that you're looking at, you have to get there and then you want some result. You know, so I always try and take any kind of screen that I'm working on and, um, 
And before I dive really far into the details of the screen, I want to split it up into beginning, middle, and end. Context. Or like, you know, past, present, and future, or whatever. Like, these three. Because um, then it, 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 I'm aware that I need to get into it somehow, and then I'm also going somewhere. And then, and then I, and then, thinking through that process, I'm able to think about, for example, the fact that, like, in order to do these things, I need an email address. He's talking about user interface there, which uh, is definitely a, a place where that is relevant. But it's also useful if you're just a database or, or backend programmer. Uh, the data that you're working with, where did it come from? Where is it going? How long are you going to have to store that around? Definitely, if we're working client side, persistence is a huge deal. Are we going to, you know, use some browser database to to store this? Are we going to sync it to the server? You know, think about that context, and not just the exact problem or thing that's being solved at the moment. Uh, was useful to me to to got me to think differently. Another huge thing, uh, definitely intentionally ignoring distractions. We have all kinds of things that can distract us. We have other things that we have to pay attention to, um, email, whatever else. Uh, but even in the project itself that we're working on, there can be distractions. Here is Kyle Neath, designer at GitHub, talking about putting too much detail into a prototype. I actually like it because I definitely like a lot of experimentation, but I've found that that's a really good way to kind of rabbit hole your project and um, start focusing on things that don't matter. Um, and so I'm a huge fan of obviously shipping as fast as possible. And a lot of that means kind of giving up that even if you are good at making very pretty design, just kind of ignore that for the time being and solve the problem. So figuring out what kinds of things to, to spend your time on, ignoring ex excruciating levels of detail if you're at the prototype stage uh, is something that he feels is important. Uh, and then a last part of a workflow is just that I've seen across multiple people is really uh, sp spending time finding the one obstacle that's going to help them solve the rest of the problems associated with an app or a, or a library or whatever they're working on. Um, Nevin Morgan in, in specifically said he'll start an iPhone application or a mobile application by just starting with the screen where people are going to spend 90% of their time. Seems kind of obvious, but some of these things it's useful to, to hear someone say that specifically and, and realize that starting with the login screen, is that the best way to start? Well, maybe you want to start by, by solving uh, one part of the app rather than just the chronological sequence of, of um, how it's put together. You know, writing pro computer programs, especially with something like test-driven development, you can do it in absolutely any order. It's not like building a house where you need to build the structure and then the wiring and the plumbing, and then finally you cover everything up with, with walls. When we're writing programs, we can do it in almost any order. So thinking about how that can be done the best and which, which way to attack that is important. Well, let's finish. I, I started with a skateboarding analogy. Uh, let's finish with uh, a few more thoughts, and one of those is, is on skateboarding. I've seen that you know really great skateboarders have flow. They can really understand 3D space, find a line through a concrete swimming pool or wherever they happen to be, and it's just kind of intuitive. You know, if you're flying toward a concrete wild concrete concrete wall. You don't have a lot of time to think and consider all the options. You just kind of have to know what to do and where to go. And I found that great programmers and designers are the same way. They just have this idea of where the project is going, how long it's going to take. Um, and I'm not talking about like a project management thing. I'm even talking about just you know minute by minute. It's not like they're keeping track of something on a paper. It's just this, this concept in their mind of, of momentum and flow. And a big part of that is realizing that your first idea isn't always your best idea. Um, a famous book by Frederick Brooks called The Mythical Man Month, he has a chapter in there where he talks about all programmers are optimists. And you kind of have to be, because if you're dealing with bugs and, and things not working, you've got to, got to be quite an optimist. But sometimes that's harmful to us, because when we come up with one solution for a problem, we want to hang on to that, and we want to have that be the final solution. But often it's 
better to throw away your first idea, consider that a pro prototype, go through and, uh, and use what you've learned to then build a better solution. Or sometimes just the process of coming up with one solution will help, will help you learn about the problem and, and make a better solution. Having a concept of time is very important. Uh, while I was recording these sessions, usually about 90 minutes with each person, I noticed that people were very attuned to time and how long things were taking and whether or not they had enough time left in approximately 90 minutes to, to implement whatever task I'd given them. And afterwards I thought maybe this is kind of artificial because we don't, we don't have just 90 minutes to solve something. Usually we have at least a couple days or a couple weeks or for a big project even longer. But I realized actually that that is a constraint. Time is a constraint. We don't have just endless resources, endless people uh, to, to solve these problems. And keeping a concept of time and is the solution that I'm trying to implement, is that going to take way more time than I actually have uh, is important. I personally am a horrible estimator, so this is something that I have to get better at. Uh, but I've noticed that really good developers and designers can do that well. And then the biggest thing that I saw, it was kind of surprising to me, is that very skilled designers and developers can change course. Uh, it's very hard to do. It takes a lot of discipline. We've got this kind of dual thing within development of where you want to have flow, you want to be able to, to be focused on something and keep working on something and you kind of build momentum. But sometimes you hit a, a dead end or you just need to realize that the thing you're working on is not going where it needs to be and you need to be able to just change course altogether. And that's something that I've seen a lot of develop, uh, skilled developers and designers do well. Here's Tim Caswell at the very moment at which this happened for him. This was not scripted or prepared. Um, he, hit, he hit a wall. Okay, let me just think about the algorithm and stop typing. I think that's my problem. So I have the words. I just need for each type, I need a list of all the matches. That's all I need. Okay, this is easy. You know, I, I've watched this clip. I mean, that's like, what, 20 seconds or something like that? He struggled for about five minutes previous to this to like, figuring out just a maybe eight line loop where he was parsing some words. And what the only thing he had to do in order to fix this was to literally take his hands off the keyboard, talk himself through it, and then as you saw right there, he figured it out in a couple seconds. And you know, right after this, then he, he types out a couple lines and it works. And just that ability to realize, you know, I'm getting stuck. I'm trudging through, uh, through this problem and I'm, you know, I'm not making any progress. And he didn't literally stand up from the computer, but he did take his hands off the keyboard and think, really hard thing to do, but, but really useful. Um, here's, uh, we'll finish then here with uh, Zed Shaw talking about how he will really put this into his regular workflow of not only being able to change course, but just throw out code altogether. Like if I'm working on something and I get halfway through and I realize, crap, I actually need to fix this other ticket, I'll actually just ditch my code. I'll just, I'll just ditch whatever I wrote. And, and the reason why is because if I get halfway through fixing something and I realize there's something else I need to fix first, anything I wrote is probably suspect. It's probably just crap because I didn't understand the problem, right? Uh -huh. So I'll just I'll ditch it. I'll totally ditch code. Just reset yeah. to the last Yeah, and just fossil, revert, and that's it. And then I'll start over, you know? And the thing is people find that weird because I guess it's hard for them to write the code, but they don't get that. It's not the code. It's the, your understanding of the problem. That you're that you're working on, right? And then it, after your fourth or fifth time of implementing something, you just do it in your sleep. So if you have faster cycles where you just like you write some code, you're like nah, you ditch it. Write some code, nah, you ditch it. Or you're just sitting there thinking, you know. And then you actually will implement something quicker. So I definitely think there's a lot that we can learn from watching other developers. Um, you know, it helped. We. Uh, Maybe this is a plug. We, you know, we sell these videos at Peep Code, so we had money to fly to other cities and meet up with people. But 
at a conference like this, uh, in your office, uh, friends, whatever, sit down, you know, take some of the, the exact problems that we gave people uh, in this series, sit down and watch somebody code on something that they're already working on. I think you'll definitely learn a lot. I know that I did. Thanks.